Morning all. We had our second decisive game in the World Championship candidates uh, being played at the moment in 2011. Mamadreov versus Gelfand, Boris Gelfand. And um, apparently Mamadreov doesn't play E4 that often, but he has played it, you know, at least 50 times. Uh, some people were saying, you know, maybe it was inexperience or something. I, I thought it was a very optimistic uh, game by White. Um, and one thing about the optimism uh, when you've got the attack, I think you've really got to factor in the opponent's counterplay somehow. Um, and especially like, you know, positional exchange sacrifices, which could emphasize the, the counterplay, uh, which, which is available. So here we have Mamadrav kicking off with e4, and we get a Sicilian from Boris Gelfand. And we get the classic Scheveningen uh, pawn structure, which um, was played by Kasparov a lot. Now the Scheveningen pawn structure after e6, uh, bishop c4 was played, and we have e6. So these two pawns are very flexible, uh, you know, for, for challenging the centre later, either with d5 or e5. Why has to keep a careful watch here on the centre? And um, it offers, you know, dynamic counterplay, this system, especially if white maybe plays uh, passively. Of course, with bishop c4, I think this has actually become uh, less popular than the bishop e3 systems, you know, with f3, which is called like the English attack. Um, but this is like, you know, stuff which uh, Fisher used to play, bishop c4. I think it's slightly gone out of fashion. Bishop b3, b5. Black does seem to have already a comfortable uh, position. The bishop is naturally posted at b7, putting pressure on e4. And also, you know, b4 has to be watched out for. White castles here, though. At the moment, uh, trying to win a pawn is theoretically dangerous. Uh, let's let's check that out. Actually, let's let's stick on um, an engine here just to answer that question concretely about b4. In case anyone's wondering, so b4 trying to nab a pawn. Apparently, knight a4 is quite good, or knight c e2 even. So if takes knight g3. Now there's there is pressure on the black position, um, and I presume enough compensation here. If if this move bishop e7, then queen g4. So black's under fire, and if if say castles here, then white will be winning the exchange. So it will be kind of dangerous to do this pawn nabbing without completing development. There's a lot of pawn moves here. So make another one just to win the e4 pawn. I think knight a4, to be honest, was something which I thought would have been um, good as well to maybe exploit b6. But the knight is decentralized there, so maybe you know black's um, slightly better than that other continuation. Uh, with this poor piece here, if it's not really doing anything, unless c4 here, th this looks pretty strong to rip open this, the position. Okay. Anyway, let's get back to the game. So, white just casually castles and bishop e7 is played. Now queen f3, which signals white's intentions really to lean over the king side and try and get some attacking opportunities. And it's rather direct uh, play, amusingly so. And we have to remember, I think, um, Steinitz. The, the key Steinitz you know, principle, which really encouraged and promoted the notion of positional chess, was that if you, if you were like a caveman and going for attacks, the attacks were not going to succeed necessarily if you didn't have any advantages, if you didn't collect small positional advantages. And you know, Steinitz was the one that really transformed the game. But here, um, we do get optimistic attacking play from White, which doesn't seem to... Um, it kind of disregards that that premise that you really need uh, an advantage. 
Uh, the Queen uh, gets pocked very, very aggressively now on G3. Okay, um, this might be theory anyway, but, uh, you know, from G3, it, it is good uh, for tying, um, you know, against D5s, you know, eyeing the Queen, but also G7 rather unsubtly, maybe uh, to follow up with Bishop H6 later which might be dangerous for black in the right circumstances. Black actually now castles straight into this to allow bishop h6. And you might wonder, well, this could be a waste of time. But often uh, this has won games for white, because I think, you know, black has to take time now to defend g7. He doesn't want to lose the exchange. So knight e8. Uh, so the knight having to get back will be another waste of time. So probably this is even a theoretical position. I guess, but um, it's it's the follow up, getting the follow ups right. Uh, you know, in this game and the game Topolov lost. You know, even though um, the, the 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 strategy concepts might have been correct, it's the, it's the implementation follow ups which also count quite a bit. So Rook A D one, which looks like a logical you know centralizing move, and so far White, you know, he hasn't at all had to waste time playing E. A3. So, you know, has black simply got a passive position here? And also, this this may be, um, you know, a bit mysterious to say this, but even the routine bishop b7 is not played here, just bishop d7. Um, so, that's quite interesting. Why not bishop b7? It might have to do with e6 being under fire. Uh, for a sacrifice. So let's just check that out. Because bishop b7, from what I was saying earlier, would have been a thematic move. But you can't play the thematic moves if the details in the position are destroying you. And in this case, I think they are. In fact, Houdini's giving bishop takes e6. Bang. So let's check this out. Takes, knight takes. And now knight takes g7. This is quite a vicious attack. Um, and apparently... Um, very dangerous. So rook g6, queen f4, and the attack might rage on here, or losing just another pawn. And white's going to be uh, a, quite a bit better, but not not that much better here. But I think it's it's in white's favour for the evaluation swing further up. Yeah, in fact, after knight d5, you can see white's advantage increasing. So that would be a a kind of um, positional sacrifice, could I say? I, but definitely, it seems the motive behind Bishop D7 is is to guard, you know, the E6 square. The bishop still has the opportunity to get onto this diagonal via C6 later. Once, if this knight's not there, he doesn't want the exchange. So Bishop D7, a much safer move than Bishop B7. Okay. So F4. Now, is this dangerous? F5, F6? Well, uh, one of the downsides of F5 is, you know, slightly weakening E5. Now, Black's um, queenside potential counterplay here, this, this is also interesting to check out. After Knight C6, uh, is Black really going to have enough time for C-file counterplay? Can you envisage the queen envisage the queen side getting kind of destroyed here? It looks unlikely at the moment, uh, but this bishop surely is going to move at some point. You know, is the king going to move to kick the bishop back? That would gain one tempo, and is it now hemmed in by its own pawn, which means that f5 is becoming uh, potentially necessary here? F5 was played, and actually, it is actually light now the position from white at the moment by Houdini, a slight advantage to white, and it was the right move apparently, f5. It does seem a very logical follow-up. White has quite a bit of pressure on e6, and it's encouraging d5 to be weakened. So, so far actually, let's not be too harsh on white's play, uh, just because we know the game result. Here, it looks as though you know this was a promising move. Um, but for some reason, the evaluation is, is now shifting after knight d4 uh, to be about equal. Let's, let's turn off the engine here. So king h8. So it's evicting the bishop back. Knight f6. Okay. 
what's going on now in the position? Where is White's attack? Is this f5 a bit too committal? e5 is slightly weakened, but it's not going to be a knight quickly coming to e5 here, unless the bishop goes there and then knight d7 to e5. That's one point. Second point, black can now qu quickly get a battery if he wants, and still b4 might be a threat in the future. Third point, you know, d5 and e5, well e5 doesn't look too tempting because it would be weakening the d5 square. But d5, uh, once the queen is protected, might be useful to try and undermine the center and make f5 look like a liability. In fact, white's next move um, gets rid of the pin now on the queen, making d5 possible. He plays actually queen h3. And it, this move might be a mistake, actually, the first mistake, because the evaluation plunges into black's favor now, believe it or not. He's allowing the liberating d5. Now, why is this so powerful here? The move uh, played was e5, but if e takes d, then e takes f5, further justifying the bishop's choice to be on d7. And this is starting to look unpleasant, for example, like this. Um, with, you know, this is a nice outpost to make white's pieces a bit passive, and, and black could potentially be winning the exchange. Um, if if this is a, a nasty diagonal, or you know if if bishop e3 here, you know th th sorry, pardon me. If bishop e3, this 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 is all going pear shaped. Either knight e3 or maybe something else. But this this looks like a good skewer with bishop c5. So this would be very very dangerous to allow e takes f5. So this could be uh, this is signalling that d5. Perhaps it wasn't the best thing to play queen h3. It's quite committal. It's not really coordinating with another piece yet for h7 to be a major vulnerability. And um, okay, so white plays e5, which offers a pawn that's seemingly very uh, dangerous uh, to take the pawn. But it's taken, and, and the bluff is called now. Okay, rook h4. So that was the idea, was it? To put pressure on h7 like that. Now, um, Boris is not too concerned. He's generating his queenside counterplay, though. Rook f c8. Now, White is getting the king a bit uh, safely out of the way. Bit of prophylaxis, but it's a bit too late. Look at Black's potential counterplay down the c file. And he actually uses now a positional sacrifice to really damage, wreck, in fact, white's queenside pawns. He plays rook takes c3. So pawn for the exchange. I think, wasn't it Petrosian that one said, you know, if he can get a pawn for the exchange, he, he, he usually, you know, does very well. Um, but, you know, here, the, the counterplay, if, if this bishop is the only defensive piece, and it's a bit stuck, uh, behind this d5 pawn, then you can see a5, a4 would gain a tempo, and these guys would be in trouble. So that would be the long term um, plan. Black could win this game just through queenside counterplay. Rook d4, and in fact, the counterplay now comes here, a5, because how is white really generating um, an attack here? Let's see, instead of rook d4, if he had played bishop g5, then the queen, you know, can be taken, so that that would mean the end of the attack, and this this would be, you know, adequate compensation. Black would be actually better here. Uh, White's piece is just misplaced. Um, this is like a Steinitz principle that you can't really attack that optimistically sometimes if you don't have uh, the grounding, you know, the positional advantages. So let's go back. So after queen c3, rook d4 sort of a, an admission that the attacks really kind of failed. So a5, now rook d3, okay, chasing the queen, but so what? Queen c6, there's enough compensation here for black, and white is now faced with this horrible move, trapping his bishop, this a4. So what does he do about a4? He has to play something like this, c3, to give his bishop an escape 
back. But it's not all bad, because it will be eyeing H7, surely, which would mean uh, more danger for the Black King. It's, it's all very optimistic, though, if White is losing lots of pawns on the Queen's side, and the attack isn't as solid as it appears. It doesn't really appear that dangerous at the moment anyway. And now black plays e5. So these center pawns are, are ominous as well. Bishop g5. As if, you know, bishop f6 is going to be dangerous for h7. But now the queen side attack rages on. You know, there's a pin now on the bishop. This bishop's loose and it's used. b4. <laughs> White is just falling to bits on the queen side it's like one of those horrible games you might have played once if you ever played a computer and they just there's no attack and you're just getting munched to bits and you can't really justify uh, losing all the material <laughs> it's a bit like that queen h4 oh the rook's gonna have another go now it just came you know like this and it's gonna have another go with rook h3 <laughs> okay <laughs> his boy is really worried by this no he just munches another pawn so rook h3, and now the, f the cheeky thing is, uh, to defend this attack, we should really flip the board, sorry about that, we should really flip the board here, and look from Back's point of view, because I'd like to quiz you guys, what would you play here if you're faced uh, with this attack? So okay, this regard that your opponent's over 2700, he's, he's just, he's pointed his bits at your king, so h7 is slightly vulnerable. There's a threat of bishop f6 and queen h7 mating. Apart from that, there's nothing much to worry about because you've collected a lot of pawns on the queen side. So what is the move you would play here? This is a great move, a star move, which really uh, demonstrates uh, black's control of the position and not being worried. It's a very simple move once you see it. So if I give you 10 seconds, have a go to try and find it. Starting from now. Okay. Boris Goffin played King G8 because he's he's basically giving his king an escape square. It's, if Bishop F6, his his king's going to make a run for it to E7. There's no attack, so check. It's it's clearly uh, better for black, black. Black. It's good. His queen's protecting the rook though. <laughs> as if he's losing a rook, but it's fine. This this position is absolutely fine. The queen's not going anywhere, and black can then carry on with the queen side, you know, attack. So it's it's a horrible, horrible position now after king g8. Um, so white, he plays rook e1, and now e4. So these pawns are marching on. Bishop's cut off a little bit more, just blocked in by that pawn on e4. And white plays another seemingly, uh, a very desperate move, g4, which usually you, you wouldn't, you know, even think of playing because you like weakening the diagonal. And now another cheeky kind of move um, from Boris, he just moves his king again to f8. Is this king really going to like make a run for it over here? Bishop e3. And now we see pressure finally on that a2 pawn with queen c4. So is, is black really going to scoop up and he's not worried about g5s? Well, the thing is he had something special prepared for g5. Another positional sacrifice. Um, I wonder if you can spot this one. This is a brilliant kind of defensive attacking game on, you know, attacking on the queen side just to mop up loads of pawns and, you know, invade on, you know, maybe the seventh rank later. Um, but to do that, you know, he needs quite a few tempo gains and avoiding his king getting mated. So this is a beautiful uh, conception now to reach a rock solid uh, position on the king side. I wonder if you can spot this next move here, which is totally approved, by the way, by Houdini as well. So 10 seconds starting from now. Okay, just bishop takes f5, offering a whole piece. 
Because if takes, well, this is what happened. Uh, this wasn't a very pretty position for white. Because these bishops are dead solid on the king side, and black is prepared to carry on, you know, munching or getting his rook to the seventh. But, um, say, say, was that really the only option, you might ask? Could the knight have retreated? If the knight retreats, it might justify, actually, white's at attacking play. In fact, queen h7, white's almost equalizing uh, here, apparently. The king cannot uh, move anymore. It's tied down to g8. And in fact, um, this, this is getting quite tricky for black. If f6... Rook g3, you know, there's there's quite serious threats now to deal with. So, uh, that was a very wise choice to play this brilliant peace sacrifice, which leaves uh, White's attack stone cold. So, Queen h5, Bishop g6. So black is playing a rook down, uh, but for quite a few pawns. At the moment, four pawns. White has two pawns. Black has three, four, five, six, seven, five pawns. Pardon me, five pawns for the rook. Okay, quite remarkable. Queen g4. Six pawns for the rook. Queen takes a2. <laughs> um, and... Okay, well, how does White defend this 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 bishop on c2? He doesn't obviously want, he doesn't want to play rook um, e2. Maybe then uh, d4 is a big problem, but it looks kind of terrible for White anyway uh, at the moment with all these pawns coming down. Queen c4. Okay, this this queen entry doesn't seem to be doing too much um, because. There'll be probably be d4 in any case, um, with the pawns further coming down, or maybe even something better than that. But white played queen g2, and now a3, immediate threat of winning back material with a2 and a1 queening. So something has to be done about that. So bishop a2 blocking that pawn. Queen c6, and now there's a threat of d4. This, this pawn's solid enough with that bishop. And that you have these like a marder of pawns coming down. Rook g3. Now instead of using um, d4, which which might be good as well. Rook b8 was played, and funny enough, White resigned here. Now let's let's look concretely why why White resigned and why you know maybe d4 wasn't chosen. Rook b8 is actually given as the strongest move. But d4 second, actually. d4, would there be anything to fear? So here, either rook a5 or rook a6. What's, so rook b8, bishop a3. That would fluff the position up totally. Not totally, actually. Even this will be better for black. But here, um, if black wants to continue, he can continue with rook a5 quite safely. Queen a8. And these pawns can go forward even more to reach this point. And white's at breaking point, I think. So rook f5. Wow, bishop h5. And now there'll be serious threats against white's king, you know, losing material. It's, all, it's just falling to bits. Okay, so um, black's just better whatever he does. But what he played apparently was really, really good here, actually. Uh, instead of this d4, it just rook b8. So let's see, why is this so devastating, this rook b2? Um, well, rook b2, what, you know, for example, wouldn't it be answered with rook e2? Let's give white uh, a token move just to see what's going on. Rook b2, rook e2. Ah, the point here is, well, there's two points, apparently. c2 is the most obvious move, which is, which is crushing. If bishop c1, then just just picking up the piece. Otherwise, queen and the pawn picking up a piece anyway. So that's good enough. But there's also uh, apparently bishop h5 as well, uh, forcing the rook to do something, and that will give black 
these terrible pawns, which again I guess can't be blockaded. Say queen c2 d4, and all these pawns are like you know space invaders. There's nothing that can be done about them. White, white really is losing lots of material. Um, once they reach this point, you know there's so many um, queening opportunities. There's a few token checks maybe, um, but that's about it. These would run out. These checks eventually. Uh, what about here? In this position now, you know how how does White defend these pawns? Difficult. He's, he starts to lose material. Finally. So rook b2 is a killer threat after rook b8. <laughs> it's just an amazing game. Say bishop b1, rook b2, bishop c2. I think a2 is strong, that is strong, and also d4 is strong. Say white desperately tries to do something uh, like this. Again, you know, the, these pawns are just too strong. So white's not given much of a chance now in this kind of continuation. These pawns are just winning material again. So it just shows the devastation actually also of a queenside attack. More subtle. Just the power of the pawns uh, being liberated and um, the past pawn potential. But a whole rook down to do this and causing white to resign um, after this rook b8 is quite an exciting game. I would say, in my opinion, this is very exciting chess. Let's review it again. Second pass through. So Sicilian defence, the old Scheveningen variation, first with a6 but e6. So bishop c4. Um, <clears throat> is that the? Uh, I'm not going to name it. I, it's. Uh, I, I think it's slightly out of fashion. This system, anyway. So bishop e7. Queen f3, very direct kind of assault on the black king, perhaps too direct. Uh, but apparently white was was doing well, and this has all been played before, of course. But bishop d7 is the right move, it seems, not to allow knight. Uh, sorry, knight. Uh, bishop e6 rather, not knight e6. Bishop e6, I think, is is the strongest. If bishop b7, so bishop d7. Now there's classic f4, f5, um, which would have been okay, I think, but the follow-up wasn't uh, quite right. So king h8 evicting the bishop, knight f6, and now this move queen h3. So white really lost the position now after allowing this liberating d5. Let's just check this position once more. So, what were the other moves here that White could have played to to keep the balance? A three even here, perhaps, perhaps. But Black seems to be kind of comfortable now. Anyway, move like A five is facilitated with that bishop on D seven. If what? Why would White be repeating rook moves? Okay, let's just play another move. Queen f3, queen b7. Takes, takes. Let's say king h1, then b4. It seems. Well, black's queenside counterplay is naturally evolving here. And he's probably winning almost the e4 pawn. Maybe not quite here. No, no, knight e4 is possible, but is also queen e4 possible? I think it is, yeah. So this this would be just classic counterplay generation on the queen side. So I don't know. White does seem to be going downhill after this f4, f5, which looked a little bit promising. But especially now with this um, queen h3, it's a very committal kind of path, especially after allowing this, this d5. So d5, d5 positionally, it's, it's hemming in uh, this bishop. Um, it's preparing. Okay, it's it seems to give White what what he wanted. You know this this kind of primitive kind of attack, but uh, you know this clever evacuation because the king here it's not clear. You know it's going to escape from such an attack. 
un until the subtle move that King G8 are played. So he takes on E5, and the rook, you know, is basically preparing the the king's escape. Really, that rook move is vacating F8, very important key move here, as well as potentially, you know, in, uh, working for the queen side initiative. And the powerful exchange sack now, you know, was was this logical and necessary? I would like to do a, a big video on it, on positional sacrifices, actually. Um, so this this is very interesting to consider what it actually uh, does. Could could Black have just played um, more s safely? Would this be more dangerous to play B4? You know, maybe there's knights, you know, coming round to G6 one day. Let's let's just check that out as well. Could B4 have been played? Well, apparently, actually, this is not good. Bishop D4. And if the queen moves here, I think this could be a total disaster on the cards. Well, Bishop F6 and then mating. <laughs> yes, that's pretty clear cut. So there's Bishop D4 is a major threat here, in fact. So Rook takes C3 technically made Bishop D4 impossible, of course, because of the queen. So White had to recapture. And now Bishop D4 again technically impossible because of Queen H3. So the exchange sack, as well as getting a pawn immediately, may, maybe it was designed um, against this Bishop D4 as well. And the king move then, this makes sense that the king move was actually designed with the idea of Bishop D4. Because otherwise, if Bishop D4 here, there was Bishop C5, I guess. So the queen doesn't have to move to allow like the mating stuff. So it's precision engineered, um, you know, position from black. Uh, defensive resources are all are all in place here after snatching this pawn. So king h1 and now rook c3, very well timed. Snuffing out white's key threat, bishop d4 basically. Netting some material on the queen side. So the rook is not so proud as, as to switch back and then back again later to try and get the h file um, attack again. But it starts to be all a bit uh, token now because black's queenside attack is just storming its way through. So this queen h4, okay, is vacating h3, of course. So again, you know, this, this seemingly dangerous idea. But now comes king g8, the evacuation contingency measures are made for the king to potentially go to e7. What else does White do here? There's, there's not, there aren't too many ways of, of carrying on the attack. Um, so Rook e1, e4. Now White has to throw in more resources. It has to make a greater investment in the attack. G4. His, his position is probably done over now. It's, it's not looking uh, particularly great at all. Bishop e3 though, as as if you know the final kind of thing to use is the g pawn to play g5. But this this really is just looked down on in effect uh, with this peace sack just just ignoring it, not n refusing to retreat, right? Like just getting these very very solid bishops now, and now Black's really in charge of the position with the queen side attack, so netting uh, even more pawns, and despite being a rook down, um. This this wasn't played, was it? Bishop a two. Oh, it was played. Sorry, Bishop a two, Queen c six. After Rook g three, just Rook b eight, and and White resigned. Quite staggering. Impression from this game. For the attack to succeed, you know, you you need to like uh, have the advantage. That's what the classical school kind of taught us. That that is what spelled the end of the Romantic era. But here, you know, White wasn't like sacrificing like crazy. Um, but just the queenside initiative, and the the one time when he wanted that bishop d4, it was totally snuffed out with the initial um, positional sack. Rook takes c3, and then later when he tried to use his last resources in the position, the g pawn, that attack was just refuted. 
by not retreating light and sacrificing a whole piece. So really fantastically played by Boris Gelfand, I, I, in my opinion. Comments or questions on YouTube? Thanks very much.